Hi, and welcome to uh, my session on the functional web framework called Fun with the Functional Web Framework. Uh, my name is Arjen Poutsma. My Twitter handle is basically my last name. Uh, I've been working on Spring for quite a while now, for 13 years almost, uh, basically doing initially the SOAP stack and later on the RESTful support that we have in Spring MVC and REST template and everything that came with that. And mo most recently I've been working since Spring 5 and since, well, since a couple of years also, almost, working on the uh, reactive support that we have in Spring. And that reactive support basically offers you two programming models, right? The annotation-based model that you probably know and love, right? The add controller, add request mapping, et cetera. And we also have, as of Spring 5, uh, a functional web framework. And that's basically the topic for this presentation. So the functional web framework, or for short, it's called Webflux FN, right? We have Webflux, it's the, our reactive stack, the non-blocking, <coughs> non uh, uh, netty operated reactor-based uh, uh, web stack called Webflux. And then we have, like I said, an annotation-based model and a functional model. And the functional model is the thing that I'm gonna talk about. So really, what is Webflux FN? Well, it's, it's basically two main types. It's, the types are handler function and router function. And these are, I'm gonna talk about those for the, in the next couple of minutes, but these are basically introduced in Spring 5, like I said. Uh, we did some further refinements in Spring 5.1 that was released last week. Um, and it's also fully supported in Spring Boot 2.0 and 2.1, in fact, the demo that I'm gonna show you in a, in, as part of this presentation is based on Spring Boot. Uh, so it's, it just is supported by all uh, Spring stacks. Now when we came up, when we started doing, working on this, um, we had a couple of design goals, right? Uh, when we created the Web MVC framework, the annotation-based framework, that was basically created as a consequence of the new language features that we got in Java 5, right? Ages ago, annotations, etc. Before that, for your old timers out there, I know if you still remember, we had an inheritance-based controller model. I'm not sure if you, abstract controller, ring any bell, simple form controller, those kind of classes. Um, then we got the annotation-based model, and now we have basically a functional model as well. And that's very important to mention that it's, it's, it's gonna be operated next to the annotation-based model, right? We're not gonna kill off the annotation-based model or, or just work on this. No, they're both gonna be there. They're just serving different audiences, different kind of programming styles. And you can pick whatever you want and they, they uh, run on the same, same foundational layer. So like I said, with Java 8, we got a lot of new, we got lambdas, right? The big feature of Java 8 was lambdas and that basically allowed us to do to program in a functional style in, in, uh, in Java, right? I'm not gonna bore you with exactly what that means, right? Pure functions, etc. but suffice it to say that if you've ever used Java Util function, right? Or specifically Java Util streams, and I guess most of you have at least seen that before, uh, you'll sort of know what it is, right? You're doing mapping operations, you're doing a lot of method changing, mapping, flat mapping, uh, etc. That's basically what a functional style comes down to. There's a couple of other uh, uh, properties, like for instance, in a functional style, you would typically, uh, a pure function, you would use, try to use at least pure functions, which always return something, rather than uh, uh, having a void return type, right? You wanna, because otherwise you're gonna have side effect, etc. and those functions should be unimportant. Um, but that's not that important, right? The important thing is basically you're gonna use lambdas. This is a lambda-based API. You don't wanna use this with abstract classes, or anonymous inner classes, like you would on previous Java versions. It's fully reactive as well, right? It's based on Reactor, just like uh, the rest of Webflux. So it it's uses the mono and flux type. I'm sure you've, if you've been to any kind of presentation this week, I'm sure you've seen those around, but I'm not gonna really delve into those because it's not really the topic of this presentation. Um, so it's fully reactive, right? It's, it's uh, asynchronous and, and, and uh, there's back pressure support, et cetera. Um, and it, another thing that's very important when we started working on this is that we had a goal of making it more a library and less of a framework. And maybe that's a bit vague, hard to explain, but um, the point is that Spring MVC, the annotation-based model at MVC, right, for short, uh, does a lot of things for you automatically. Right? There's a lot of things going on, and I'll highlight some of those in my presentation as I'm comparing the two models between each other. Um, but there's a lot of stuff going on. And if you know that, 
right? And it's very nice, right? If you, if you learned how, what's, what Spring MVC is doing for you, for instance, uh, the, doing content type management, right? The content negotiation, figuring out what kind of media type is, is requested by the user through some sort of, either through an accept header or a file extension or something like that. Spring MVC annotation base does that for you. But, uh, interesting enough, not all people appreciate that. Some po people don't like the magic and want to be really explicit and really say, okay, I don't, want, I don't want to configure this framework to do what I want. I just want to explicitly code what I want it to do. And that's more how this framework works. So it's, it's in that sense, less of a framework, less magic, more explicitness. But since we have Java 8 now and Lambdas, we can actually make it very short as well, right? That used to be the problem, obviously, in, in previous GDKs that if you had a very explicit uh, API, it would basically mean in Java that you had to write a heck of a lot of code. And that, with Java Lambdas, that's not really true anymore. So, um, more library, less framework. Finally, it wasn't really a goal, but it was sort of a nice side effect that this framework does not use any kind of reflection. And you might say, what does it matter? Uh, and it doesn't matter for a typical application, right? The, what Spring does or what Spring Boot does, does at startup, it will search the class path for all kinds of annotations, inspect them, uh, the at controller annotations and looking at the at request mapping annotations, seeing how they, how they can match those, those, uh, the metadata that you provide, how that matches up until an incoming request, right? So you, you, you write a path, for instance, and you, the, the Spring will check against that pattern that you provided against the incoming request. Um, but it still has to do reflection. It basically means overhead at startup time, right? And if in a typical application, it doesn't mean it matter that much. It's only a one-time initialization. But now, with the rise of, of sort of uh, function as a service, right, where you have, you want to have the startup time reduced as much as possible, uh, we are much more looking into solutions that don't really require reflection as much, or at least very much restricted to places where we, uh, um, where we can't do without it, basically. So, but I'm saying there's no reflection. There's no reflection on the web parts. I'm still going to use Spring Boot. I'm still going to use at Bean in my presentation. I'm still going to use all of those. So there's some reflection going on. But the th important thing to know is that the web part, and if you would use functional Bean registration, as, as Sebastian is going to talk about tomorrow in his talk, I'll provide a link to that at the end of the presentation. But um, if you, you would use functional bean registration, there wouldn't be any kind of uh, uh, reflection done at all, right? So the goal here is, once again, quicker startup times and also being able to operate in an environment such as Graal VM. Not sure if you heard of that, but that's basically a new development that sort of pre-compiles your Java application into a, an application that can start up quicker because it's all already linked. It's my very simple explanation of what Corral is, and it's probably wrong, but <laughs> you get the point, right? Quicker startup time, that's the goal as well. So, Webflux FM, handler function and router function. So first we're gonna hand, start looking at the handler function. What is a handler function? Well, a handler function is a function that maps from a server request to a server response. Now, server request and server response are both new types as part of this functional web framework. Um, but they are basically comparable to, say, the request entity or HTTP entity if you ever use that in Spring MVC, right? If you want to return an object as well as uh, set its headers, then you would typically use a request entity or response entity, I guess. Um, and these are basically comparable. So here in my example here, I have two handler functions, right? One is called show people, it's just a method, right? And later on, I'll show you how you can make that a, refer to the method, method references, but uh, for now, it's just a method. And you can see that it maps from, it takes a server request as a parameter, and it returns a delayed uh, server response, right? So that's basically what it meant with, uh, it's, it's reactor-based, it's reactiveness is built in, right? Any kind of response that you're gonna return, it can be delayed, can be, take longer, it can be, the method can return as quickly as possible, but the actual writing of the response uh, can be delayed until, a, uh, until sufficient data comes in to facilitate that. So, returning a mono server response, we have, like I said, two methods, show people's the first one, that's basically goes to a uh, repository. In my demo that I'm gonna show later, I'm using Mongo, but as of now, or as of yesterday, we have, uh, no, this morning, we have the announcement that we could actually also use uh, uh, JDBC SQL, right? That's the new announcement this morning that we are gonna do 
uh, Spring Data JBC, and then make it make it based on uh, on, the, on or let it be expose a re reactive types as well. So, but it's a reactive repository. Let's just say that. So that reactive repository will return rather than a list of people, it will return a flux. Right? Once again, mono being a single item, flux being zero or more. Basically, a an possibly endless stream of elements, in this case, people. So we do a find all, and then we say, return the server response. I want to set the status to OK, and the body should be that flux that I just got out of the, uh, out of the repository. And finally, I have to provide it with the, the type. Um, and what's going to happen is that's going to return a response with an OK status. And then as these results come in from the database, right, as one comes in, we're just going to write that out as JSON, for example, or HTML or any kind. And when the next element comes down the stream, we'll write that out as well. So you're basically dealing with at most one of these people objects at a time, right? Just streaming them through and writing them as they, come, they pass along. So that's the first example. Very. I hope that's understandable. The one question you might have, so why do I need to provide the person class type? Well, like I said, that there's two reasons for this, basically. One thing is that Java uh, uh, doesn't allow us to uh, inspect that. Uh, uh, all generics are basically lost at, at runtime, so we cannot use those. We have to basically provide it with a type. So we are framing up the whole response pipeline to basically say, this is going to write a person at some point, and then the person's object comes in from the database, and then we're going to straight out write it to, to the HTTP response. Second example is a bit more complex, maybe. Um, so we have another request coming in, and we have another, so we, we want to use a path variable right here. We have sort of a, uh, a deta master detail list, right? So people, all people, and then we have individual persons. So we're looking up a path variable. It gives us a, a string ID, and then we're going to use the same repository to find something in that, in that uh, uh, to find the person by that idea that will probably return or that will return a mono of person, right? A single person object. And we're going to flat map that. So we're going to map that to another server response with that body as the, uh, with that person as the body. However, the last line might require a little bit of explanation where we basically say, well, if there isn't, right? If the stream the, the mono of person, the, the stream that can, will contain the single object does not contain the object, so it's empty, and I want you to return a 404. That's basically what we're doing here. So if you provide a valid ID, we, we, we show it to you. If you don't provide a valid ID, we'll do a not found. All right? Yes, question. No, no, we're not using a request. The question was, in the first example, the request object is not used. That's true. And you would think, why, why do I need to declare it then? Yes. <laughs> well, the reason is, otherwise it wouldn't be a handler function, right? Like I said, maps, it, handler function maps from a server request to a, well, it should be delayed, basically a delayed server response, right? Mono of a server response. So in, a, in the next slide, I'll show you that you'll link to the specific method and that you'll, so it needs to have that specific signature. Otherwise, it simply isn't a handler function. Any other questions at this point? Yes, in the back. I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. You have to speak up a bit. Yes. How do we know if the How does the cloud client know there's no response? End of the response. End of the response. The client, the, well, the client will just get JSON, right? The only difference with a normal standard Spring of a C application is that rather than obtaining a list of people from the repository, we're just getting a stream, and as they come in, once again, we route it to JSON, and then at the end, because we're sort of assuming that this is an endless stream, it could be, oh, sorry, was, we're assuming that this stream has an end, right? There's a limited amount of people, and then when we, we get the end, then we write basically the, the closing curly braces and everything for the JSON response. Does that answer your question? If not, then I probably don't understand the question. <laughs> uh, I'm still curious how, like, say I have a sheet of data coming in, right? Yes. Yeah. 
It's a yeah, it's a JSON page. It's basically the same as any kind of Spring FC application, like I said, except that you would return you're returning a stream of items, and that stream will end at some point, and then it's basically when when the response is completed. So the client will just get this data as it's being written out, and at some point the the, connect, the, the stream will be closed, the, the response will be done, and the client will know, just like any other HTTP. From an HTTP perspective, there's nothing different about this than Spring FC, right? You get exactly the same output. The only difference is that in a server-based application, you would deal with all the people at the same time, the entire collection, and you would just iterate over that and write them out individually. Well, in a Webflux-based application, we can just take each element as it comes down to stream, write it out, and then when we reach the end of the stream, finish it up. There was one more question back there, and then I'm going to continue, otherwise. <laughs> Yeah. So then will that wait and essentially be a mono of a list of people? No. No. No, this is basically a mono of a response, and the body of the response can be another publisher, basically, can be another. So we have basically two sorts of two uh, um, separate delay properties here. So one being the response itself, so that sort of means the status code and the uh, headers and everything. That's what you give up first, right? That's part of the response. Uh, and then the body comes, and the body can also be delayed further. So first of all, we write the headers, and then we see the stream of the body coming in, and that's where we start writing that. So yeah, it's a good question. There's basically two, two delayed properties here. So then can this still uh, do like the, the one at a time server set events, uh, since the, the body can be the body is a plug? This can certainly, yeah, this can do server side events. I just didn't have that in my demo, but yes, we can do. All the things you can do with Webflux annotation-based, you can do with this as well. That includes server sent events as well. So if your stream is endless, right, you do have a lot of events, not people probably, because there's a finite amount of people. Uh, but uh, let's say you have incoming stock quotes and stuff like that. That could be it's a very good use case for server sent events, right? And you would just have an endless stream of, and each time a, a stock quote comes in, you'll, you'll write it again, and the client will consume it at that point, because it's already flushed out right away. All right, I'm gonna move on because possibly your questions will be answered in my subsequent slides. So. so this is only the handling part, right? The handler function. And earlier I mentioned that we have Webflux event consists of a handler function, but also a router function. And that's basically, oh no, sorry. First we're gonna <laughs> do a little bit of this. We're gonna compare uh, basically on the left-hand side, I hope this is visible in the back. If not, my slides will be downloadable later. But on the left-hand side, we have the functional approach that you just saw on the earlier slide. And on the right-hand side, you basically have the annotation-based approach that you would take. So you're seeing the, si the same patterns approach, right? So in the right-hand side, we would return a flux of, peop of people, of person objects, straight out of the repository. And the other one is still a bit complicated. We're returning a mono of a response entity of a person. And that's very similar to the one you see before, right? The, the one you see on the left. Basically, you're using a path variable. Well, in the annotation-based variant, you get that from an annotation, right? Makes sense, the ID. And then you use that ID to find one and then map it to a response entity with OK status. If it's there and if it's not, not there, you would use build another, uh, another entity, a not found entity. So there's, I hope you can see that it's very similar. But the only difference being that in the annotations-based side, you have flexible method signatures, while on the left-hand side, you basically have to write handler functions, and the handler functions are, once again, mapping from server requests to response. All right. So this is only the handling side. Right? Now we're going to look at the routing side. So a router function is a function that maps from a server request to a handler function. Right, you, and that's basically the job in Spring FVC, the annotation based, that would be the annotation, right? Request mapping. That's basically a sort of a router function in a way. Uh, so, and you use request predicates to do so. So little tests, basically. You typically, in a Spring Boot application at least, you would wire those up as a beam, right? But you could also do it as, uh, like I said, with functional beam configuration to increase the startup time, or I'm sorry, decrease the startup time. Um, but here I'm using at bean just to keep it comfortable for everybody. Um, and you would use, in previously in Spring 5, you would use this API to do so. You would call a static method called uh, route, and you say, any get that comes in for people ID, I want to map that to show person 
and basically show a person, this is a, a Java 8 method reference, right? I'm sure you've seen those, where you can, rather than providing an inline lambda, you could, I'll show you later in the demo, but you could really type an inline lambda here. You, instead of referring to show person, you could say request and then arrow sign response, right? But it's usually, that gets messy quite quickly, right? And to keep them separate and to keep it basically in a separate method and to refer to that method, I think is a lot cleaner, uh, just in general with Java 8. So yeah, rerouting to any all gets that come in to people with uh, path variable ID, map that to show person, and routing all gets to people to show people. Now, since we brought this out, a lot of people complained, right? And they said, ooh, this is static imports, and I don't like static imports. And that's fine, I guess, right? Because it's, uh, it's sort of hard to discover how, how this works, right? If you don't know how to start, you can't really control space your way through with this static imports. You really have to know what to import first, and then you can refer to it. So it's, in terms of discoverability, it's not ideal. So what we did in Spring 5 is that we made a new API called the Builder, and now we have a uh, parameterless uh, version of route, it's still a static import, but that's the only static import you need to do. And you don't even have to do that statically, you can just say router functions dot route. Um, and then you get a builder style, right? So you do control space and you get all the list of methods, or get in this case, and, uh, and post and all the other ones, uh, and you'll just do it the same. So this basically comes down to the same. These two variants do exactly the same, so that one uses this, the new API in, uh, in Spring 5.1. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna use that throughout the entire uh, demo, so um, just to show you how that works. So once again, let's do a comparison, right? Now on the right hand, left hand side, we have both the handler functions and the router function. And on the right hand side, we have the annotation based function. And you already think, I'm already looking at you guys saying, why on earth would you type all this mess on the left hand side when you can do the thing on the right hand side? And that hopefully will come clear <laughs> by the end of the presentation that there are reasons for doing this. If it's very simple domain like this, it's probably not worth it, but there are valid reasons for doing so. So you can see the semblances, right? So rather the, um, the request methods, the, uh, the methods themselves basically map to the handler functions on the left-hand side, right? So show people maps to show person. Uh, oh, I should have, should have named those the same, I guess, not show, show people and show person, but. Um, oh, the lines, the arrows are wrong. I'm noticing it now. Yeah, the arrows should be the other way around. I'm sorry. Or, or not. No, it's right, I'm confused. Show person, show people. Oh, uh, it's not wrong. I'm just, I can't read. <laughs> All right, so yes, I did it well. <laughs> so we have on the left-hand side, we have the handler functions and they map really nicely to the, uh, the annotation-based methods. And then the routing itself, that's basically done in Spring FC, that's done by annotations, right? You can see we're mapping slash people with the method get, HTTP method get, and we're doing the same on the left-hand side. Um, but the important thing to see here is that these two are separate, right? Your routing is separate from your handling, and that's basically the flexibility that, that this method will give you. In the annotation-based version, you are basically stuck whatever class structure you have, that's only what you can basically map to because that's where you can put annotations. But on the left-hand side, you can do multiple uh, mappings on the same method, all kinds of flexibility that you don't, simply don't have in annotations. Right? Other thing that's important to note for now is that you are rather than with annotations, you are basically supplying metadata. And with metadata, the only thing you can do is uh, um, provide the, the data that we as Spring developers thought of, right? So you can provide the path pattern, you can provide the method, but for instance, you cannot, uh, you cannot say, I want to route all requests that come in which have 20 HTTP headers to this method, right? It's a very similar example, but I'm just forcing the issue here, right? You cannot customize it. The, the annotations request mapping contains these particular elements, right? Pattern, method, uh, accept, and uh, consumes, that's, and some headers as well, but that's pretty much it. While um, here, it's all functions, so you can write your own. We provide a lot of them ourselves, but you can basically write your own. So here, we are using, a bit more complex scenario, we're saying, well, I just don't wanna, not just routing get people ID to a render person, 
but I want to make sure that the browser or the client also accepts HTML. So here I'm using a so-called request predicate to specify so. I'm saying the, the method should be get, the, pattern, the path pattern should match to this particular expression, slash people, slash ID, and the accept header should contain HTML. And because it's, you're programming here, you're not supplying metadata, you can actually use best practices as you have those for normal programs, right? So proper names, for instance. So here we're saying, these are my HTML routes, and here, these are my JSON routes, and now I'm going to combine them by just saying, simply uh, concatenating them, or not concatenating them, but merging them, saying, okay, this one and this one, that's my mapping. And that's a really big advantage, I think, as well, compared to the notation model. You can program these kind of things. You can write them, you can give them proper names, you can give them a proper scope. All that is gonna, I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So these request predicates, like accept that we're using here, and under the covers, the get and the, the pattern are also predicates, are basically, yet again, functions that map from a server request to a Boolean, right? And not a delayed, not a mono of a Boolean, but a real Boolean, because we don't want the mapping part or the, the, uh, the routing part to be asynchronous. It's just, it just should be quickly. We should be very quickly at mapping to a particular method. If that's uh, impossible, then basically, well, that's basically why we're mapping to a Boolean and not a delayed Boolean. So you can, there's provided predicates, right, that we provide based on the HTTP method, the path pattern, but also the extension. Uh, query parameters, headers, like for instance content type, and the accept one that you saw earlier. So there's a lot of here things to digest here, and I think I'm better off now showing it to you rather than telling you about it. And uh, that's so I'm switching over to my demo. I hope this is. Can you see the guys see this in the back? Is it readable? Yeah. yeah good. All right. So I have a. This is just a normal Spring, uh, like I said, a normal um, Spring Boot app using 2.0 M3. Um, I have an embedded Mongo database in here. I have using this punk, the starters from Spring Boot. And then I have an application here. And I'm not using uh, add Spring application here because that detects, auto detects all the configuration objects in your, on your class path. And here I want to, as you can already see, I have th three different kinds of configuration all the rest of the code base will remain the same, but I'm just going to show you through different kinds of congregation how, how, uh, how you can use this framework. So that's why I'm not, I'm explicitly importing, in this case, demo one configuration, and later on I'll switch to demo two and demo three. So here it's not much going on. It's a, there's a data a command line runner which inserts some data into our database, right? You can see that the domain of this application is a pet clinic, right? I mean, as an old time, Spring guy, you, you cannot really expect me to do anything else. Uh, so we have a pet, right? I'm using Lombok here just to make it easier. Data, a data type with an ID, a birthday, and we have, well, let's, we don't need owner right now, but there's also an owner domain. Then we have a repository. It's just a, a Spring Data MongoDB repository, a reactive MongoDB repository with a, a re managing pets, and then the ID, uh, ID is a string. And what else do I have? No, I don't have to show that yet. This is not. And I have my handler here. So this is basically my controller class. In, in, so it's hand, gonna handle the uh, web request. So I have, it uses a pet repository just through uh, constructor injection. And it basically has the two methods that I just showed you, except that they're now based on pets rather than people. But it's the same thing, right? So we have a show pets, which list finds all the pets, get me back a flux of pets. I, I can show you where that comes from. Um, I'm not sure if I can download sources right now. So this is basically the Mongo, here we go, the MongoDB reactive repository, reactive crud repository. You see all the operations that it provides. So when we're getting all the pets, um, and then we're basically saying, return a server response with content type JSON and with the body of pets. We have the individual pet where we're saying, let's look up a path variable and let's map that to a individual response object. Oh no, that's over here, sorry. Now, in my configuration, 
I'm going to show you how this is all mapped. So here, I, this is a configuration class, right? We have two beans defined in that, the path handler that you just saw, with, which is initiated with the repository, and then we're basically creating a router function. So we're saying, given the path handler, I want to use route. And here you can see basically all the methods that are provided, right? You can see there's get, there's, pa there's post, put, delete, et cetera, all the options. There's other ones as well. You can do resources, all kinds of stuff, but it's typically you would just use pet with a pattern and a, a, a possibly explicit extra predicate, and then you're mapping to a handler function. So like I said, I could do inline, right? That's what I mentioned before. So let's say an example foo, and I can say, uh, Request server response dot ok dot well build right this is what I mean with the inline uh, doing it inline but you can see that this if you're doing it a lot of time it will just get very complicated quickly right uh, and this is a very example but typically you would do something like this because you have to do something with the with the request etc so method references really I think make that a lot more readable. So we are reusing those. We're referring to the path handler, which is provided via dependency injection, saying if, if the exact header contains HTML, refer to render pets. If, uh, for this one as well, right, if it's HTML and the pattern is pets, then go to that one. Building that, then we have our HTML route right here. We're doing pretty much the same for the JSON route, except that we're referring to different methods. Right, you see this here. This is the rendering. This is basically the um, model one view. So I'm using a, um, a time leaf here. Right? The time leaf has support for reactive views. Basically, we can create a, a, a HTML response reactively. So that's what we're using here, um, and we're using returning basically a rendering response. So we're saying, okay, HTML there, JSON here. And my route for this application is going to be both, right? I'm just composing the two router functions into a new router function, which is basically the combined of those two. So let's start it up and see if it works. This is a very old computer, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> oh, one, in, one interesting thing here that you might want to take a look at, and that's coming from the uh, router function mapping log, um, is this bit. In your log, if you enable it on trace level, it will basically print out the complete mapping as it's registered. So in this case, we're seeing get and pets should go there, and except is text email should be go there. Unfortunately, Java, you would think that this would be a, uh, well, in this case, it would say, uh, refer to show pets, right? So it would be nice. It would be nice if Java would provide a nice string for method references. I hope they do that at some point. But that now, for now, you're basically stuck with this unfortunate name. And maybe at some point, we'll get a nicer to string out of a method reference. Because that's basically what's being printed here. So yeah, you can see the entire route here. Get and pets goes there. If the acceptor there's JSON, go there, and so on and so on. So that started up. There's some data inserted as well. And now I'm going to use um, terminal. Maybe make this a bit bigger. And I'm just going to say, OK, first I'm going to do a normal request. And this is HTML. It doesn't really matter what it says for you guys in the back, but it's just an HTML representation of it. And that's, why did it pick the HTML? I didn't supply any kind of header. As you can see, there's no accept header here. And basically, it's very simple. The first route that it comes across will be the one that you uh, it will pick. So in this case, it will basically say, it's HTML is the first one, saying, does it hit match this one? No. Does it match this one? Yes. I mean. We're not supplying an accept header, and that basically in HTTP 1 or, or any kind of HTTP, that means I accept everything. So HTML is the thing you're going to get. If you don't want that, obviously you could switch it around, right? You want to make JSON the default, you put that up front. I could basically show you very, here we go. If we flip that around and start it up again, we'll get the JSON probably. 
hopefully. And that's also different than Spring MVC. Spring MVC or the annotation at MVC. We, with Spring MVC, we are basically seeing which mapping is the most specific and, and which annotation, right? which request mapping is the most specific, and that's the one that's going to win. Here is just the first come, first one that matches, that's the one you're going to get. Very simple, very predictable model. The other model is maybe more convenient, but it also has some downsides because that more specific, what does it mean to be more specific? It's, it's a very tricky, tricky uh, paradigm. So this now works. Let's see if the, uh, hopefully, my, see, now we're getting JC because now that's the first one. And I can take, go there, right? I can take one of these IDs and, and go to that particular page, that particular resource. You'll see that it provides the individual one. And then I can just change it a little bit, use an invalid ID, so remove some. And I should have a 404, and I do, right? So that, that all works, right? We're switching. This is where the switch if empty comes from, right? You, you're not getting any database for this particular ID from the database, so we're switching to an empty response. And you'll see here, it's a bit more, uh, if I go back to the pet handler, it's a bit more complex than I showed in my slide because I'm doing a mono defer here. And what it basically means is that I'm not building this object until it's needed. Right? So we're providing a closure or a, a, a provider here. We're using a, basically another Lambda to make sure that we don't unnecessarily uh, build this object. We could have done this. Right? This would do exactly the same. But then the way Java works, it's, it's eagerly initialized. So this will just say, OK, I'm going to build this whether I need this or not. I'm going to build that response whether I need it or not. So that's why the defer comes in. And these are just methods on mono. Right? These are the same methods that you can use on any kind of mono operation. This is uh, coming from mono. And you'll find the same sort of uh, methods on, on a flux as well. So that's what I meant initially while saying it's really based on, uh, really based on, uh, builds on top of Reactor. All right, so what else can I show you? Um, yeah, going back to the mapping, the, there we go, this, right? This is the request predicate that comes out from a class called request predicates, right? a very similar uh, typical Java pattern where you have the, the, the type itself, the request predicate. That's a simple interface. Just one method, basically, test, and it returns a Boolean. And there's some other methods which allow you to negate, etc. but that's not really. And then we say we have the utility class that comes with that, and that's basically request predicates, which offers you a whole range of, of sort of typical predicates that you'd use. There's one named all, which is basically matches everything. One for each specific method, right? You can provide an HTTP method or multiple methods even saying, I want to uh, map to this if it's either a put or a post, for instance, or a um, well, head or a get, right? Those kind of cases. Um, path pattern is also there, right? We are using a little side note. We have completely updated and, and, and really sped up our pattern matching in uh, Spring 5 as part of Spring 5 as well. The, we used to use the end path matcher. Not sure if you ever saw that type used or that class used, but now we have a very quick and fast parser, which is a lot, really speeds up pattern parsing as well. Um, so yeah, path, you can match on a path. You can match on particular headers, saying uh, you can match on the content type, saying if the content type is either of these provided types, right, where you some data is posted, saying is the data is posted is JSON, I want to map to this particular handler method. Um, and then you have the accept one, which I already showed you. So either you can provide a whole bunch of media types saying, if any of those is in the accept header, then map to this. But you can also write your own, right? This is, once again, it's a function. So I can, uh, I'm not here in my configuration, Rather than doing this, I can say, let's, uh, for instance, let's say that if I want to say, maybe do something like, uh, um, if it's um, HTML, it's not just, uh, it should map to the HTML endpoints, not just if it's the accept header is, is HTML, but also if it has, for instance, a, uh, or, no, sorry, it should map to the JSON 
let's put it different. If the extension is JSON, right, dot JSON, so rather than specifying an accept header, I also want to map to the JSON route or the JSON methods when the, the path extension is, um, is JSON. So I could say, right, just an inline predicate here, I could say uh, request dot headers, dot, uh, this should go, dot accept, and it contains, uh, you know, that's the one. And then I can say, or, no, sorry. And, sorry, request dot path ends with JSON. Okay, so now I'm saying I'm writing my own predicates, and this is something you would you can do, right, if you have specific, very specific routing requests, but uh, it's nice to know you, you, can, you can do that. I would typically do that, however, more in a, um, in a, uh, a separate method, right? So let's say we're building a request public here, saying, okay, public static request predicates. And so let's call the method is HTML. And that's basically going to say return accept HTML. And right, this is just going to do the same as this thing. Say, and the um, path extension is not JSON. Right? And then I can refer to that over here, saying so is HTML. Oops, one more comma, there we go. So now we're building our own request predicates. We're saying, we're sort of doing content, content negotiation, but we're doing it manually. We're doing it more explicitly as you would do with Spring and VC. Because we cannot really, as Spring Framework, we cannot really say how you want to do your content negotiations. The content negotiations, some people want to do it based on extension, some people want to do it based on content on the accept header, uh, and it's very easy to just build your own predicates to do that this way. So let's see if this works. Let's flip them around again so that the HTML one is first. So what I expect that if I provide a, um, let's do it like this, if I provide a, um, a map, a request to pets ID and then with the JSON extension, it should not match the HTML, right? Well, if I provide any kind of other extension, it should, if that makes sense. That's where the negation comes in, right? That's where we have to negate here. So we're saying, it's ex if we should be, it's, it's, it's HTML, if either if the accept header is HTML and the path extension is not, uh, not JSON. So. Go there. There we go. Copying one of the IDs here. Now I get HTML, right? But now, if I do this, there we go. See? Now I get JSON, because I'm basically saying it shouldn't map on the JSON. All right. I think that's all I have to show for this particular demo. Are there any questions about this? But I sort of want to move on, so maybe we can keep the most of the questions to the end. But are there any questions specifically to what you just saw? No? Either means it's very clear, <laughs> or you didn't understand anything. <laughs> all right, so um, let's all roll this all back. Let's roll everything back. I'll provide the GitHub link at the end of the presentation, so there's no need to take pictures of anything. It's all on GitHub, uh, this code. So, going back to the slides. Well, there's some room for improvement here still, right? This, there's a lot of duplication here, and that's never good, right? One of the key principles as a programmer is don't repeat yourself. One of the key principles, no. <laughs> um, So, 
we are having, this is a duplication, right? That's this, but also this. This is duplicate, this is duplicate. It would be nice if we don't have to specify those multiple times. We just do it once saying, and if I want to change the path to whatever animals instead of pets or whatever, then I just have to do it in one place. Now, I could use a constant string for that, obviously, but it's not ideal, right? You wanna, what you would do in Spring MVC is you would put the annotation on top, on the class level, right? You would say, uh, request mapping on class level, and then sort everything that comes under, sort of infers that one from the top. So you'd say, slash paths at the top, at the class level, and then each individual mapping method you would specify it further. So we're gonna need a method to do that as well with our routing functions, and that's basically what we're doing with nested routing. That's the next topic. I'm gonna have to take a short drink here. So this is nesting, nested router functions. A nested router function maps, right? Remember, a normal router function maps from the request to a handler function. A nested router function maps to, from the request to a router function. So it's an extra step of indirection, basically. We're not mapping to the thing that's gonna handle the request, we're mapping to the thing that knows which thing is gonna handle the requests, right? <laughs> that's what's called, that's, that's why it's called nesting. So we're nesting here, and I think the best way to read this is to start from the bottom, right? So we're saying building a route with a particular path, and then the path method actually is a way of nesting, right, in this DSL. And I'm just gonna say, I want you to map those HTML and JSON routes uh, to nest those within a people, basically. So everything, that they're mapping to should be prefixed in a way, the pattern path should be prefixed with uh, people. What else are we doing here on top? We're saying, well, we're nesting also based on the accept header. So you can basically nest any kind of predicates, right? Earlier I showed you all the predicates, accept header is one predicate. So here we are nesting uh, HTML. The, the DSL provides us a builder, right? The same sort of API, we can use that builder to build another two routes in this case. And we're just basically ignoring the, uh, or sort of in, the, the people comes from below, right? So this is basically before and after. This is how, what you had before, right? A lot of duplication here. And now we're saying, let's get rid of all that duplication. Let's put it all in one spot. So if I want to change it, it's, I only have to change it in one spot. And we're also gonna duplicate the, uh, or remove the duplication when it comes to the, the uh, other predicates, the headers, et cetera. Now, how would you do that in Spring MVC? Well, this particular use case, and now we're getting into the interesting, or now we're getting into the, the areas where this, web, this uh, Webflux FN really shines, is that you really cannot do this exact thing with the annotations, right? As you already can see on the left, right-hand side, we can, we're basically stuck with the, the type as it's provided, right? So we can provide a, uh, a request mapping at the top of the class level, but that's it, we cannot really specify a group of methods within a controller and saying, well, these group of methods also need additional mapping requirements, right? You basically have to create a new class. So that's why here we are forced to create two classes, one for handling the HTML, right? Uh, right? The people, basically, you can see the similarities, right? The people is basically mapped to those two. And you can see that the HTML goes on top as well. And you can see that the JSON goes there as well, right? There's no real way to do the same thing on the, on the left-hand side as you, on the, in the annotation based land. Uh, well, you could, I guess, create an abstract base class maybe and annotate that and then et cetera, work with that, but it's, it's tricky, right? So, demo time again. So I'm gonna switch over now to the other configuration, like I said. So I have, I'm gonna use this one. So let's take a look at what's in there. Similar thing, pet handler, but now we are using nested routes. So we're saying routes, nest, well, let's take a look at the nest method, what it does, it says some example provided as well. Well, maybe I'll just better off maybe looking at the Java doc. Uh, no, too small. So we're writing to a build function if the, if the given request predicate applies. And we basically can give any kind of a predicate. It can be a path-based predicate, but it can be any kind. It can be some one you write yourself, even. Nesting to that gives us a builder, and we use that builder to build the two routes underneath. Now, because the pets is already implied, it comes in here, right? We'd only have to provide the ID here. 
And here we don't even need to provide the pattern here because it's already good enough like it is. And finally we say, okay, we have these two routes. We have a JSON route, we have an HTML route. Let's compose those again, as we do here, like, just like in the previous presentation or in the previous demo. But now we're gonna sort of prepend that with a path, we prepend that with a, a pattern. So first it's gonna check if this one matches. If that, comes, if that one matches, then we're going on. We're saying, okay, let's see if this matches. Let's see if the remainder of the path matches with this pattern, right? We already sort of chopped off the paths part, if it matched, we sort of chopping it off and passing it on as any, the path that now anything except that particular pattern. Um, so that's that, right? We're using nesting here. This is basically the way, I'm now also gonna use, show you the other part of this uh, API. There's also an owner handler, does pretty much the same, right? We have basically two domain objects here, paths, which you already saw, now we have owners. Um, the owner handler, does pretty much the same thing. No need to go into that in any depth. It just represents a different kind of object. Here we're using a static API. I just wanted to show you the static imports based API. So here we're, rather than using the builder, right, like we're doing here with route and then build, here we're saying nest these two predicates, right, nest the path pattern and the accept header. And if that's true, then route any gets you get to show owner. And if you have any other, <coughs> if the, um, and with a sub pattern ID and just route all other methods with slash owners to show owners. Does it make sense? Yeah. Let's see if it works too. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, let's see here. All right. So I'm using the, the right configuration. Let's start it up. There we go. Well, you're already seeing that the, the debug mode, right, the trace element that I showed you earlier is getting a bit more complicated now, or at least more elaborate. So now we're saying we have here mapping slash paths to, and then you get all kinds of braces because you're nesting, right? You're saying if it's paths and the, and the except is the XHTML, then map here. If it's JSON, Map here, etc. So this sort of gives you a, a string representation of your mapping, right? Just useful for debugging purposes. Oops. Um, and then we have the other routes, right? All routes are basically detected. So in here, in my configuration, I'm now exposing two routes. Right? One is the pet router, I called it, and the other is the owner router. And like I said, these will basically be matched in order. And in this case, it doesn't really matter because they're very exclusive. One, what, one matches slash pets, the other slash owner. So there's no, absolutely no possibility that they could both compete for the same request, right? But it's important to know that it's handled in the order that they're registered in. Um, so that's where we're getting the other request here, the other mapping over here. And let's get back to the terminal. And nothing, I mean, if everything went right, you shouldn't see any change because it's exactly the same code. So yeah, I'm getting the HTML here, right, slash patch, then I can go to an individual one. Let's copy, copy the ID, slash that. Yep, and I get a detail page for Leo, and if I specify an accept header, whoops, accept uh, application. JSON, then I get a JSON representation. If I go to owners, oops, owners, I'll get, get to see the owners. Right. So that's nesting. Nesting is very important. You can um, typically based, nest based on paths, like I said, path patterns. But, like a, but you can also nest on any kind of other, like we do here, we're nesting on the accept header, but we can also be nesting based on content type, for instance, grouping, grouping related routes together into, and we only, so we only have to specify the predicates once. That's what we're doing here. Any questions about this? 
No? I'm so afraid I lost you guys. <laughs> All right. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Oh, yeah. If I... And the last thing I want to talk about today before we go into questions um, is, is the most advanced topic, I would argue, is the handler filter function. So what's a handler filter function? Right, the answer, is, once again, is at the top. A handler filter function maps a request and a handler function to a response. And that, that handler function is basically, you could see it as the next, or the, the handler function that's actually going to be invoked. So I can you can also stop invoking it, like I do here, right? Here I have a very simple security filter, right? You can see that this method here fulfills the contract of a handler filter function, right? It takes a request and it takes a handler function and it returns a mono over response. And then I have some silly security manager which just checks the request if I have access, right? And if it does, then I say, okay, well, now I'm going to the next item in the chain, right? That's the next handler. And it could be Typically, that's, uh, uh, that next handler will be the, uh, the handler method that actually resolves the request. But it could also be another filter, right? There's no reason why you cannot have multiple filters. One does. And these filters are really useful for cross-cutting concerns, things like security, things like logging, things like maybe timing a request, stuff like that. Things you want to do uh, across your entire, or at least a lot of routes. And because you can program these routes, right? I showed you earlier, they are variables. You can just filter where it makes sense. You can filter on a particular uh, group of routes, not just all of them. Um, so here, we're saying, OK, if, it's, if, it's, if I have access, or if the request is, is good, the current user has access, whatever that means, um, I'm returning the request, the next one, right? Next one in the, in, the, in the chain. If it doesn't, then I'm simply returning a forbidden result. So I'm saying, OK, access denied. So I'm going to switch over to another demo for that. As you expect, that's going to be the third demo configuration class. So I have a security manager here, and I have a random security manager that you might want to know what it is. Well, the name sort of says it all. Do I have access? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And please don't, <laughs> don't just use Spring Security, right? By all means, never write your own security-based code. This is just an example. Never write your own security-based code, unless you know what you're doing. I don't, as you can see. Um, we have the same, pretty much the same configuration as before. We have a path handler. We have a, uh, uh, an owner, response, owner handler, both registered as beans, right? We could even make this public. Should probably make that public. Doesn't matter that much. Um, and now I want to basically apply the filter to both, to both routes. And these routes are basically going to be um, created here, right? They're exactly the same as you saw before, so I'm not going to go deeply into that. We have our pets route, nested one, and we have our owner route. And uh, we could apply the security filter right now, but that basically means that I'm blocking myself from the application. So I'm going to start off with uh, a bit more simpler example where I say, OK, let's write an inline handler function. Yeah. Let's see how that works. So I'm, OK, I have this. I'm going to create a sort of a timer. So I'm going to say instant using a new Java 5 API. So start is, uh, well, that's an instant now. Then I'm going to say, the next one in line, right? And the, the actual handler function is going to resolve the request. Um, handle that. Store the response. And I'm going to say time to duration. Duration is uh, duration between and then start. So let's start. Instant now. So that basically shows me how much time it took just to resolve the request, right? Just to handle the request. 
note that because it's asynchronous, it doesn't mean, it doesn't include all the time that needed to write the response, all that other stuff. That's not included with this timing. It's very simple. And I'm gonna just print it out saying, okay, print that out saying, request took, whoops, took, and then duration two millis, something like that. Okay. And then obviously, it's already, IntelliJ is already complaining, saying you should return something. Well, then I want to return the response, right? This is, if you ever did Spring AOP, uh, this is very similar to a sort of around advice, if you know what I mean, right? You have basically your invoke before, and then you're, you have the option of invoking the target method. That's what we're doing here. But if I wouldn't do this, if I would comment this out, then we would basically never invoke the handler method. It would never be invoked. Oh, it is invoked now. And let's keep out the security filter for now, because, yeah. Let's see how this works. So going back to my app. Start it up. Okay, so yeah, you see our complete route printed out here. And then I can just say, let's do a request, any request. And if everything went well, see, request took 17 milliseconds. So it works. Same thing, show you it also works for pets, right? Also should show you, here we go, request took five milliseconds. And once again, that's only the handling of the, re of the request, right? Not the writing it out because that's all delayed. We're using monos here, so that's, that's not included here with this timer, just invoking that method and just calling it basically. Um, and as I said, you can apply this filter, and now I'm applying it to the entire uh, chain, right? That's what I'm doing here. The pets router and the router, the owner router, both have applied, have this filter applied on it. But you can also do so on any other route. So here I have the pets router. I can say, well, pets are a very sensitive subject. So let's take, let's make sure that they're, whoops, that it's done securely. So I'm going to filter that with my security filter. That's I defined down here, right? That's another method reference here. And my security filter, once again, uh, just says, if I have access, and that in this case means random Boolean, right? Uh, allow it to go through. If not, then give the status forbidden. So let's see how that works. And because I only applied that filter to the security part, uh, it should only filter those, right? So only get access denied on that part. And this is, once again, the flexibility that you have through this model is not something you can easily achieve with Spring MVC, right? Because, they're, because these are programmable objects, right? Your route is an object that you can interact with and take apart and, and concatenate with others. That's not something you can do with metadata at all. You cannot do it in XML. It's just a program. You can work with this stuff as it is in any kind of code. All right, did it start up? I'm guessing yes. So now I should see the one thing about using random in your demos is that you're never gonna, <laughs> it could be that I keep getting access all the time. So here, okay, so now it works, right? Pets works, I get access, let's try it again. Oops, yeah, that's what I figured. Ah, here we go, <laughs> could have been here all night. Uh, so now it's forbidden, right? And I try again, it works again, so. Or I could apply that to, to any, so yeah, filters are really, Place, a filter is really a place where you do sort of cross-cutting, like similar to a, a serverless filter, right? Uh, but then you can apply it much more easily to specific routes, not just based on paths, what you can do with a serverless filter. You can basically only apply them to a particular path, but here you can say all the routes that have an accept header, that use an accept header, combine them into one, and then apply the filter to them, independent of path or whatever. Um, so that's the handler filter function. I don't think, I'm not sure if we still provide, let's see here. I think we actually provide a couple of them out of the box. Let's see if we, I can't remember. Handler filter functions. Filter functions. No, I'm confused. 
On the client side, we have a similar model, right? If you ever use the web client, we have a very similar model called an exchange filter, and we actually provide some of those by default, but we don't have any filter functions uh, provided. So that's pretty much all I wanted to show you today. Um, this is the link, right, to the GitHub repo. I'll get to questions in a second. Tomorrow there's a, uh, a if you are, this is all Java, right? A lot of Java code. If you are at all interested in JSON, or sorry, JSON, Kotlin. Um, for one, there's a talk afterwards here. Mark is gonna talk about sp using Spring and Kotlin. But this specific web framework, right? The, the WebFlux FN, the functional web framework, also has a Kotlin version. And because Kotlin has a lot more flexibility in terms of DSLs, it's actually a lot more uh, friendly, I think. If you're at all interested in Kotlin, I would really recommend going to Sebastian's talk tomorrow. He'll also show you a lot of interesting new stuff about bean registration, not just in Java, but also uh, uh, in Kotlin, like I said. And now I have time, five minutes or so, for some questions. I think I saw a question there in the back, yeah? The server response is, uh, is proprietary to Spring. I mean, it's a, it's a Java 8 API, a Java 8 a, a, uh, immutable based API that basically wraps a server request. By the way, it's interesting that you put up that. I don't know, we are actually thinking of also providing this model uh, on the server environments. It's not there yet, right? But we are thinking about having the sort of the same programming model, but then instead of using mono, we would use optional. Um, and that's also something, so you don't get the asynchronousity that you get from WebFlux, but you do get the, the functional programming API. So if we do that, that might make Spring 5.2, not sure yet, I have to convince my colleagues. Uh, if we do that, then we basically have two runtimes, right? We have servlet and we have WebFlux, the reactive runtime, and then we have two programming models as well. We have annotation-based and functional for both those environments. So if you are not really interested in asynchronousity, but you are interested in this programming model, then uh, uh, it might be interesting to you. One more question, I think, yes. The server web exchange. Uh, that's a very low level object, basically. That's sort of hidden by this API. It's a, a server web exchange is basically the request and response together. Um, but you don't really get, to, if you're using the functional framework that I just showed you, you don't really need to use that object. Because the, here the response is already there, but with the functional web framework, the, you already create, you always say it's creating a response, right? It's a very purely functional model. Always have to return an object, and that object is gonna be your response. So I think that's all we have time for right now. I will be here around here for asking more questions, but Mark is gonna talk now about uh, Kotlin. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.